The lesson this morning is taken from Psalm 1 and also Psalm 2. And we found on page 489 in the Pew Bible. Psalm 1 is titled, The Two Ways. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither, and all that they do they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Continuing on Psalm 2. Title, God's Promise to His Anointed. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his spirit, saying, I have set the king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear with trembling. Kiss his feet, or he will be angry. And you will perish in the way, but his wrath is quickly kingdom. Happy are all those who take refuge in him. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Lord, as we open up your word this morning, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as, uh, as you most likely know, something pretty incredible happened this past week. Uh, there was a space probe named New Horizons that made it to the edge of our solar system. It flew right by Pluto, which when I was growing up was planet Pluto, but now apparently it's not a planet, um, which is very sad for Pluto. But anyway, uh, we had this New Horizons space probe that made it to the edge of our solar system. New Horizons had been journeying through space for nine and a half years traveling at a speed of a little over 36,000 miles per hour. Let me say that again. It has been flying through space at a speed of 36,000 miles per hour for nine and a half years. And this past Tuesday, New Horizons reached Pluto, which is over three billion miles away from where it started here on Earth. Let me say that again. <laughs> New Horizons has traveled a distance of over 3 billion miles. That's about 32 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And then, within only about a day, back here on Earth, we had crystal clear pictures of Pluto, allowing scientists and all the rest of us the chance to see the terrain and features of this object 
that is over 3 billion miles away from us, out there on the outer edge of our solar system. We had pictures within just one day. Do you remember when it would take you weeks just to get your vacation pictures developed? And we had pictures of Pluto from billions of miles away within one day. How astounding is that? How awe-inspiring is that? Seriously, think about it. This week, all of us had the chance to see a part of God's creation that nobody had ever seen before. And in fact, that nobody even knew existed until just a few generations ago. And within a day of the New Horizons space probe flying by over 3 billion miles away, we all got to see it. A friend of mine uh, posted a little story on Facebook um, on uh, Wednesday evening. And she posted about how uh, she had uh, pulled out her phone, looked up the images, and then showed them to her son and said, look, Pluto, this picture was taken yesterday. Look at what we can see. And his response was, cool. <laughs> now, she had just used a device that most of us carry around in our pockets. She had used it without even really thinking about it. She used it to pull up pictures that were taken the day before, three billion miles away, and show it to her son. And his response, Cool. And then he went back to whatever it was he was doing. Does that strike anyone else as perhaps the wrong reaction? <laughs> that that is profoundly the, the wrong, profoundly the wrong response to something like this. And I don't want to be too hard on that kid because the truth is that's kind of how we all are at times, isn't it? There are times when for whatever reason, we just forget how to respond appropriately to things. At least I know that I do. We were on vacation uh, the past two weeks, and a few days before we were leaving, I saw a commercial on TV for a brand new cereal that's like Lucky Charms, you know, one of those cereals with all the marshmallow bits in it. Only this time, the little shapes, this was Star Wars themed Lucky Charms. And I kid you not, my reaction was this. I went to Rachel, and I said, they have Star Wars Lucky Charm cereal. That is awesome. <laughs> we need to get that for when we're at the beach. <laughs> Apparently, that is not awesome. <laughs> Seeing pictures of Pluto from three billion miles away within a day, that is awesome. That is awe-inspiring. That was just cereal. <laughs> See, I think that sometimes we lose our sense of perspective. We lose our ability to genuinely and truly stand in awe of that which is worthy of standing in awe before. We are confused about appropriate responses. Today, we are starting a new series of sermons. We're going to spend uh, the next six weeks looking at the book of Psalms. Obviously, in only six weeks, we're just barely going to scratch the surface of this book that's 150 chapters long. But what I hope is that over the course of the next several weeks, we'll all kind of whet our appetites a little bit for what a great gift God has given us in these 150 psalms. Because you see, in the psalms, we're taken on a journey. We are taken on a journey that sometimes, sometimes takes us to the highest of heights, to places of pure joy and awe and wonder, and at other times, a journey that takes us to places of grief and sorrow. See, the Psalms, they take us to places of both fear and thanksgiving, both anger and trust, lament and praise. The Psalms, they don't hold anything back. They guide us. And they help us respond appropriately to life. So here's how we're going to do this. Beginning next week, we're going to start looking at um, what is kind of the flow of the Psalms. We're going to begin next week with praise, which is a very common theme in the Psalms. So we're going to explore that a little bit next week. And then the week after, we're going to look at the theme of lament. And then we're going to move on to trust. 
and then thanksgiving, and then we're going to end up back at praise again. Now, this is not the only way to begin studying the Psalms. There are all kinds of good, fruitful ways to dive into this book. But this is how we're going to do it for the next several weeks, because all of those themes, praise, lament, trust, thanksgiving, they are, they are all over the place in the Psalms. In fact, you often find those themes tugging at each other and pulling at each other within the same psalm with the psalmist moving from one to the other and then maybe back again. So this is kind of the flow that we're going to follow in the next several weeks, beginning with praise and joy, but then moving into lament or sorrow or despair or guilt. And then from there to trust, and from that trust moving into, into thanksgiving. And then from thanksgiving, finding out that it's possible to rejoice and praise God once again. This kind of movement, this flow, is well, it's something that we all experience, isn't it? These, these ups and these downs of life. In a way, this flow is kind of the journey of life, isn't it? We all go through these different seasons. We have times when it is easy to come to church and rejoice and praise God, but we also have those times when well, we just want to yell at God. Let's be honest here. We have those times when we just want to question God. Why? What were you thinking? Why did you let that happen? We also have those seasons where all we can do is trust and maybe even hope against hope. And then we have those seasons when we are just overcome with gratitude and thankfulness. So that's how we're going to dive into the Psalms over these next few weeks. And so this morning, as we explore a little bit these first two psalms, as we're going to we're going to look at them, we're going to use them to help orient us and give us a general overview and some ways to think about the psalms, or ways even to experience them. We're going to see them as giving us a type of framework to begin thinking about this Old Testament book in the Bible. Now, psalm 1 opens with a statement about being happy. Or it could also be translated as, as being blessed. Happy or blessed are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season. And their leaves do not wither. In all that they do they prosper. And Psalm 1 goes on and concludes by saying that the wicked, however, they're like chaff blown away in the wind. Follow God, delight in the law, or the path of the way of the Lord, and you will prosper and be blessed and happy. Don't follow God, ignore his law, or path, or his way, and the opposite will happen. The book of Psalms starts out with this affirmation about how life works. Do good and good things will happen. Do bad, bad things will happen. But then something interesting happens. We get to Psalm 2, and suddenly, it's not so cut and dry. Because Psalm 2 begins with a question, and not just any question, it begins with kind of a cry. Why? Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? Psalm 2 comes along right after Psalm 1 and wonders, why things haven't worked out exactly the way Psalm 1 led us to believe, believe that they would work out. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. See, so here in Psalm 2, now we have, we have a people who have rejected God and God's ways and path and law. And they're the ones sitting as kings of the earth and rulers of the nations. That doesn't look like they're chaff in the wind, does it? Because they're the ones in the places of power. And who are they plotting against? Who are they persecuting? Those who are trying to follow the law or the path of the Lord. Being on the receiving end of this persecution, it doesn't, it doesn't look much like a life of prosperity, does it? Things, it seems have gotten a little messier here in Psalm 2. Life, life has come in and made things more complicated. 
Well, Psalm 2 goes on with, with some reassurance, reminding us that even despite these circumstances, the Lord still sits in the heavens, and the Lord has made a promise. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And then it makes this decree. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Do those words sound familiar to anybody? God speaking about a begotten son. It's got some New Testament flavor, doesn't it? Now this psalm would have initially referred to the kings that God anointed for ancient Israel. But even they were always meant to point to the true king. The true anointed one. The true Messiah. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Yes, I told you the Psalms don't hold anything back. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, with trembling kiss his feet, or he will be angry and you will perish in, this, in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. You see, there is still, in Psalm 2, there is still this promise of Psalm 1 going on here. But it's got a bit more complicated, hasn't it? Because once sin gets mixed up in it all, things get confused. Life stops being so cut and dry. It gets messier. Now, it could be our own sin or someone else's sin that's making it messier. It could be kind of a collective sin that makes life messier. But many of us here, well, we don't, this morning, we don't need Scripture to tell us this truth, though, do we? We know this all too well. And so this picture of following the path of the Lord, of delighting in and meditating on His law, which leads to a happy and blessed life, this picture gets stretched out. Now there's sort of this in-between time going on, a time when it begins to look like those promises of Psalm 1 are, are not true, or at least they're not being fulfilled at this point in time. But still, still the Lord is there in Psalm 2. The Lord is still here. He is still at work, even in this in-between time, as Psalm 2 assures us. But the ultimate resolution, the ultimate fulfillment now, as Psalm 2 again hints, it's bound up in this messianic hope and this promise of something off in the future. This second psalm begins to look forward to salvation and redemption that the Messiah will bring. And even though you and I live on the other side of Christ's first coming, this first advent, we are, we are still in that in-between time, aren't we, when life is complicated and messy. Because we still await the second advent, his promised second coming, when all things are going to be made new. And now, in this in-between time, whereas Psalm 1 began with, happy or blessed are those who follow the path of the Lord. Now Psalm 2, did you notice how Psalm 2 ended? It ends with, happy or blessed are those who take refuge in the Lord. And that's what these psalms are going to invite us to do, to go on this journey, maybe go on a lot of journeys, maybe go on a lifetime of journeys, but journeys that lead us to this place of refuge, of finding shelter in the Lord. You know, one of the most basic truths about journeys is that you can only start where you are. Now, it took us 12 hours to drive to visit family and friends in Virginia a few weeks ago, and it would have been wonderful if we could have started closer. But we couldn't. We had to start from 12 hours away for the simple reason that that's where we were when we started, 12 hours away. We had to start where we were. It's the same thing with these psalms. They allow us God allows us to start right where we are, wherever that is. Are you joyful and full of praise and rejoicing this morning? Great, God says, start there. Are you angry, even angry at God? Are you grieving? Are you unsure or doubting? Or are you a mixture of all of these things? Through the Psalms, God says, great, start there. And so the Psalms, they give us not just permission to do that, but they even give us the language to do that when, 
Maybe we're having trouble coming up with the words and the attitudes ourselves. Now, if you look in most any Bible, you can look in the few Bibles if you want, and you can look at Psalm 1, and you'll see that there's a superscription above it. And it says, Book 1. And underneath that, it'll say Psalms 1 through 41. And so then if you go to Psalm 42, you'll see it says Book 2. And underneath it, it'll say Psalms 42 through 72. And if you keep following this pattern, you'd see that Book 3 of the Psalms is Psalms 73 through 89. Book 4 is Psalms 90 through 106. And Book 5 is Psalms 107 to 150. The Psalms are divided into five books. Now, when they were compiled, when the Psalms were compiled together, when God inspired not just the composition of these Psalms over uh, the course of we don't know how many years or generations, but when he also inspired their composition and their collection into the book we know of as the Book of Psalms, it was compiled and se separated into five different books. And there's a lot of reasons for them being divided up this way. Uh, for example, uh, here's just one quick one. The only time the word Amen appears in the Psalms is at the end of each of the first four books. At the end of Psalm 41, Psalm 72, 89, and 106. Amen separates them into distinct books. And there's other things that scholars will talk about, like uh, different themes and stuff going on in each book. But the reason I bring this up for today is that once the Psalms were compiled and became one unit of Scripture, these five books of the Psalms they began to be seen in light of the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they, those first five books, they were known as the five books of Moses. And the Psalms began to be thought of as the five books of David. So you had the five books of Moses and the five books of David. You had the five books of Moses where God is giving the law and God is acting and God is creating and God is redeeming and God is calling people out of captivity. The five books of Moses where God is doing the speaking. Then you had the five books of David, where God, God's now actually the audience, because the Psalms are the words of people to God. In the five books of David, we are the ones speaking. In the five books of Moses, where God is speaking and acting, and then you have the five books of David, where we are responding to what God has said and done. Family, that is a fantastic way to enter into the Psalms. These are divinely ordained, spirit-inspired responses to God in the midst of life that is lived in this meantime, in the in-between time that we see opening up in these first two Psalms. The Psalms, they give us not just permission and space to respond to God, and I mean really authentically respond to God from wherever we are at any given time. But through these psalms, God guides us into the appropriate responses to what God has done. Sometimes the appropriate response is this pure praise and rejoicing. And sometimes the appropriate response is humble thanksgiving. Sometimes it is a resolve simply to trust you. And sometimes the appropriate response to whatever is going on in life, the appropriate response is lament. Sometimes it's to feel angry, even at God. Sometimes in life, the proper response is to cry out, why? And we know this because we find all of these responses here in this Holy Spirit-inspired, God-breathed book of the Bible. You see, God's grace, we see this when we begin diving into the Psalms. God's grace is such that when we often become confused about what our proper responses should be, God gives us a guide for that journey so that he can lead us from where we are, wherever that is, so that he can lead us from where we are to where he wants us to be. And that's what we're going to be exploring through the Psalms over these next few weeks. Family, God's words are powerful. The words
words he gives us to use are powerful. They have the ability to transform lives. What a gift God has given us here in these psalms. Let's pray. God, through your words, you called forth light where there was once darkness, order where there was once confusion, life where there was death. And in your grace, you have given us these words here in your scripture to guide us from confusion to truth, from darkness into light, and from death to new life. And all of this is possible. Because you have not just given us words, but you have given us the word. The word who became flesh for us, and in whom we find our hope, our peace, our salvation, and our refuge. Lord, may your words of scripture always, always point us and guide us and lead us to him. Amen.